neighbors. Loneliness was far from neighbors. And I remember using a book, which was really a novel, called Giants in the Earth for my history class. And it described the loneliness of a Scandinavian woman who had traveled out to the Great Plains as a pioneer in the United States. People went west and went out to the Great Plains. And it was endless prairie. As far as the eye could see, not one tree, not even a little elevation of the landscape. There was no church steeple. She came from a Scandinavian, you know, where they country where they had little villages with the, the markets. Where, none of that was there. No buildings to indicate a town square or other persons. Nothing. Nothing. She actually lost her mind out there, far from neighbors. But loneliness is a contemporary issue. One, even in crowded cities where neighbors are still far away, although they are right next door. Stephanie Cacciocco says this way, Loneliness is an indication that you are already suffering from a lack of connection. Modern loneliness, Amelia Worsley writes, isn't just about being physically removed from other people. Instead, it's an emotional state of feeling apart from others without necessarily being so. There might be many different ways, if we sat down together and chatted in a circle tonight, that a variety of causes that increase this problem, but there are large numbers of lonely people. In fact, I think in England now they have a Ministry of Loneliness, a Department of State, to deal with the issue. There are, in America, there's 22 to 75 percent of American adults persistently lonely, spending more time on their own. John Caccipio, in his book of March 2018 called Loneliness, observes, Western societies have demoted human gregariousness from a necessity to an incident. It used to be necessary, part of what you did. Now it's just occasional. Finding connectedness is a body and mind thing, researchers have found out. That's why for all of our menial ways of linking up with people, it's not the same as taking a walk with somebody, drinking a cup of coffee together, and telling our stories to someone who's right there with us. There's an interesting story that Mark tells in his gospel, and I'd like us to read it with this in mind. Mark 1, or Mark 5, excuse me, verses 1 to 20. And I'm reading out of the New Living Translation, so it might differ just a tad from the version you have in your hand. Jesus heals a demonic, a demon-possessed man. So they arrived at the other side of the lake in the region of the Gerizims. When Jesus climbed out of the boat, a man possessed by an evil spirit came out from the tombs to meet him. This man lived in the burial caves and could no longer be restrained even with a chain. Whenever he was put into chains and, chains and shackles, as he often was, he snapped the chains from his wrists and smashed the shackles. No one was strong enough to subdue him. Day and night he wandered around among the burial caves and in the hills, howling and cutting himself with sharp stones. When Jesus was still some distance away, the man saw him, ran to meet him, and bowed low before him. With a shriek he screamed, Why are you interfering with me, Jesus, Son of the Most High God? In the name of God I beg you, don't torture me. For Jesus had already said in the Spirit, Come out of the man, you evil spirit. Then Jesus demanded, what is your name? And he replied, my name is Legion, because there are many of us inside this man. <laughs> then the evil spirits begged him again and again not to send them to some distant place. There happened to be a large herd of pigs feeding on the hillside. 
hillside nearby, send us into those pigs. The spirits beg, let us enter them. So Jesus gave them permission. The evil spirits came out of the man and entered the pigs, and the entire herd of about 2,000 pigs plunged down the steep hillside into the lake and drowned in the water. The herdsmen fled to the nearby town and the surrounding countryside, spreading the news as they ran. People rushed out to see what had happened. A crowd soon gathered around Jesus, and they saw the man who had been possessed by the legion of demons. He was sitting there fully clothed and perfectly sane. And they were all afraid. Then those who had seen what had happened told the others about the demon-possessed man and pigs, and the crowd began pleading with Jesus to go away and leave them alone. As Jesus was getting into the boat, the man who had been demon-possessed begged to go with him, but Jesus said, No, go home to your family and tell them everything the Lord has done for you and how merciful he has been. So the man started off to visit the ten towns of that region and began to proclaim the great things Jesus had done for him, and everyone was amazed at what he told them. Now I'm suspecting you're asking yourself, how are you going to tie this story to the matter of loneliness, huh? You're thinking that with me? Well, good, because you're on the right page then. It's obvious in this story that there's a man totally alone out in the hills close to the town. He is just cut off from everything. He's been ostracized by the community because no one knows what to do with him. He seems dangerous and overpowers everyone. And he hurts himself by his behavior. He cuts himself with stones. Everyone has come to the conclusion, let him stay out there, and that's a way of pre preserving us in here. Nobody was upset by the distance. They liked it that way. The word evil and demons enter this description, and an evil spirit has also been translated in this text as an unclean spirit. The man has become tied in knots, however you want to describe how he got that way. The end result is he's tormented. And I wondered to myself if he actually gradually got this way. Did he have issues and nobody cared? Did he gradually feel pushed out of the society that he was in? Did these inner demons gradually take up more space until he was fully tormented? What I know about our culture if you have mental illness, people are most likely to tell you to go to a facility. And when you get into a psychiatric ward, a fellow like this one in our story would be pumped full of drugs to quiet him down into a zombie-like state. When I say this, I know there are exceptions where people need medications to quiet them down, but Alfred has no cases, and not just singular cases, where too much medication has shortened the lives of people he knew. It's an easy, convenient way to get some folk to be quiet. You just pump them full. But medications don't solve loneliness, although there are medications being developed, and I saw that researchers are hoping to provide a loneliness pill down the road. You know, wouldn't it be great to feel lonely? You pop a pill and you don't feel lonely anymore. That seems weird to me, but we have lots of drugs out there that do weird things. But connection to others is at the heart of Connection to others. In our story, it's interesting, Jesus enters the sea, and when he lands on the lake shore, the man sees him, and what does he do? Runs toward Jesus. 
His first longing actually is to be connected to Jesus. I think that's interesting. And it's interesting that the inner demons don't want the man to get connected to Jesus. That's also interesting. Don't interfere with us. Can I say it this way? Seldom do our inner demons want to leave us. When we do battle with our inner self where all of these things can be, when we go deep into the depths of our hearts, we find all sorts of stuff that we would prefer to leave alone, but these demons won't leave us alone. Therefore, they must be faced. Jesus helps the man by getting the demons to identify themselves. Do you know that's the hardest part of our inner demons, naming them? <coughs> if you ask sometimes people, what's your problem? Most people can't really define it very well. And if you have multiple layers of things that make you disconnect from folk, it sure would be hard to define them all, to give them names as to how you got yourself into this predicament. It's hard to name them, but once they're named, they can be confronted and dealt with. Jesus helps the man tied in knots and names the problem and deals with the problem. Jesus says to these troublesome, inner, conflictual, unclean spirits tormenting this man, leave him alone and don't And here is another part to the story of loneliness. The pigs were a profitable part of the local economy. Jesus sent the evil spirit away from the man, and the pigs went over the brink of the cliff, which shows how destructive these powers were that were in that man. The news spread, and people were curious, maybe just to see, I was thinking in my own cynical self. Maybe they came to see what it looked like to have 2,000 pigs in a lake right near where they lived, laying there in the water all day. You know how people are. They're curious about all sorts of things. But what they were not expecting to find was this man fully in his right mind. Our text says he was sane. Whatever had distressed and tormented him had been sent out. But interestingly, they were not ready to receive him back into their community, sane or not. They weren't trusting him. This is also typical of our society. Restoration, receiving people back. Someone who has gone through deep water is not what our society does well. It's not as economically interesting as 2,000 pigs. But just, Jesus doesn't leave this situation alone either, which I'm always grateful for. The story goes a bit further. The man wants to be with Jesus, and that's an obvious thing. Jesus is getting back into the boat, wants to leave, and the man said, oh, I think I'd like to go with you. I can understand that, wouldn't you? I think I'd vote to jump in the boat with Jesus as well. But Jesus wants something more to take place, restoration, to take place within the community where this man was. And the man has to do his part as well. Loneliness requires our willingness to get engaged. Stephanie, I mentioned before, lost her husband, John, who wrote the book on loneliness. And then she had to do the things that both of them had researched, which I also think is interesting. Doing research is one thing, living it out is another thing. Stephanie said she's now relying on many of the social fitness exercises. I thought that was cool. Social fitness exercises that the couple validated together such as making an effort to express gratitude, a social fitness exercise, doing something nice for someone else without expecting something in return. 
Choosing to engage strangers and sharing good news with others. Those are social fitness exercises. I thought that sounded really quite healthy when you get right down to it. And she says, this Stephanie here, I am living proof of my science. I apply it every day. Jesus knew the man had to do his social fitness exercises. So, what did he tell the man? Go home to your family. Oh, that must be the hardest place to go. Back home to the family. I mean, the family must not have done a whole lot to help him when he was out there on that place of despair. So Jesus said, go back to your family and tell them everything the Lord has done for you. And tell them how merciful he has been. And the man, now delivered, could also be a catalyst for reconnecting back into the community. I find it's beautiful. Jesus delivered him from the bondage he was in, and he helped to restore the community by going back to the very place he probably did not want to go to. That's a challenge in itself. There's a book that I have been reading, and the young man in the book, who's now an adult, tells about the mentoring he received when he was first becoming a Christian. And the man who mentored him said to him one time, What are you doing this Saturday? And the young guy said, about the age of Cora, maybe a dash younger, 17, 16, 17, oh, I'm going to be busy. And the man said, Busy doing what? And of course, the young guy didn't have a plan. He just didn't, was resisting whatever this guy had in mind. He said, Give me a couple of hours of your time on Saturday. And so the young fellow thought, Oh, I will. So the man picked him up and took him in his car to a nursing home. They got out of the car and his friend had a box of chocolates. And then they went into the nursing home and asked the people there, where are some of the people who don't have very many visitors? And you can imagine there was almost everybody there in the nursing home who hadn't had very many visitors. So you know what they began doing? Knocking? On each door, whoever said, come on in, they went in, gave the person a chocolate, and began talking to them. And the thing that came out of this, and this young man went back many times, is that the people there had all kinds of interesting things to say, but they had no one to whom they could tell their stories. Loneliness is being so disconnected that you don't have anyone for whom you can really tell, or to whom you can really tell your stories. Telling our stories to people who listen, in trust of course, removes loneliness and restores community. Jesus knew in our story precisely what this man needed to do to get restored, to get out of that state of being isolated and alone, and how to get back into community. And Jesus knows us as well and can help us when we're struggling because I think every one of us struggles from time to time with this question of feeling not connected. For those of us who have moved here from other countries, I can say a whole long story of my moments of disconnected feelings. Even going downtown and walking the streets of a familiar city, if you're all alone, you feel not very well connected. But Jesus says to us, here's a way of getting back into community. Let me touch your life. Deal with your inner stuff that may tie you in knots. And I will help you to reconnect and do your social fitness exercises. Thank you.